So I'm going to try to say this word, and I'm going to put my fake Norwegian accent on it, and then you can say it correctly for us. This event is called the Ersfjord Traversen. Oh, that's really good, Kurt. So it's uh, Ersfjord Traversen. The Ersfjord Traversen. Ersfjord Traversen. The Ersfjord Traversen. <laughs> nice. It's a traverse of a full mountain ridge, uh, which consists of like, it, it's many mountains that are connected and they are following a fjord. Um, so it follows it from the beginning all the way to the ocean. Episode 319, traversing a full mountain range in northern Norway with Jens Jacob Anderson. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hi friends, Kurt here. Thank you so much for listening again to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Today's show is on running, but not just any running. This is running in Northern Europe. We're going to be talking about some of the events that they have up there that I think are are fairly unique. Our guest today is Jens Jacob Anderson. He is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and he spent a lot of time in Norway as well. He is also the founder of the company runrepeat.com. And this company has an amazing approach to running a business. They provide running shoes to runners in a unique way. But what's even more interesting is that the company was founded to create location and time independence using modern technology so that the employees have a greater opportunity to do their own adventure sports. And it's it's an idea whose time has come. But we don't see it in the world today like we would expect or hope that we could Uh, So I'm really excited to talk to Jens about that approach to work and to play and about running and the different types of crazy running events that they have there in Northern Europe. So Jens, welcome to the program. What an introduction. Thank you very much, Kurt. (laughs) Hey, you know what? I have to tell our listeners, we tried that introduction three times. I finally got it. (laughs) Yeah, let's see if this is the final one. (laughs) I think it'll work this time. So... Jens, what got you into running in the first place? Yeah, so actually I was playing soccer and I loved it, but got injured as many other kids. And uh, I had to stay in shape. And what better way to stay in shape than running? So I picked up running and it turned out I really loved it. So I did more and more and picked up my mileage and did more intervals and more tempt runs. And I was really structured, structured and I enjoyed it. And I always ran just for myself. I never ran with any friends or in any club. You know, people, some prefer to be in groups, some with a few friends. I rarely did any races either. I just ran for myself and enjoyed it. And then one day, the track and field coach, he uh, he saw me at the stadium because I always jumped the fence to the stadium in the evening so that I could do <laughs> intervals. Um uh, because I didn't want a membership. And I did my 400 meter intervals uh, there. And uh, he, apparently he tracked my time and he said, you're a pretty good runner if I wanted to start in his club. I was like, ah, no, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. And he had an event. It was like a regional championship in cross country. So I was like, yeah, okay, maybe it would be fun. I could test my shape. And it turned out that I, that I won. So I won the regional championship in cross country. Wow, good job. So that got me really excited in running. Um, so since then, I ran a lot, still mostly for myself. But obviously, this guy also knew a lot about running that I did not know. So I learned a lot from him, uh, which was I, I really appreciate. I mean, having mentors or coaches uh, in the outdoors or in running or in life in general, just yeah, really important, I'd say. So that's how I got into running. That is a really cool story. You know, a couple of points that I like there is that you do it primarily for yourself. I think that adventure sports are like that, right? People Mm -hmm. really aren't doing it for fame or fortune so much as they're doing it because they're passionate about it. They enjoy what they're doing. And running, I totally get that. I think that the human body was made to run. And 
people often find running a little painful when they first start. There's a, there's that hurdle to overcome. But once you kind of get into running, it just feels so good to be out there yeah. going at the speed that your body will allow you to go with the wind in your face and the sun on your back. I, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. The feeling of the body functioning well, I think that's a lovely feeling. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I didn't mean to take the conversation in this direction, but let's go ahead and, and address that. If someone is not a runner and they're curious about it, uh, do you have some advice on how they might get started in a way that would be rewarding instead of just painful? That's a good one, actually. I'd say, first and foremost, running is not for everyone. I think today we have an idea that everyone must be running. Oh, you're not running. I mean, everyone should stay in shape, but there are many ways to stay in shape and live a healthy life. Uh, so I'm a fan of running because it's it's so simple and so efficient. But I'd also like to say that while I love it, not everyone should love it. We have different interests in our lives and we should follow follow that. But if one is about to start running, I'd say first and foremost, <laughs> uh, stay calm. And the biggest mistake one can make is to progress too fast. So of all things, that's it happens to 90% of all people, they progress too fast, feel too well, run more and more, get injured, get a bad experience from running, never runs again. And that's typical. So stay out slow, never progress more than, so the rule of thumb is 10% per week, and then rest every fourth or fifth week where you do like maybe maybe scale down 30%. So uh, that, that would be actually my number one advice. Ah, another advice would be, uh, don't go out and buy fancy equipment until you've done it a few times, until you've been running a few times and explore, found out if it's really something you want to do. Your old running shoes will be doing just fine. Okay. How many times a week do you advise someone to run if they want to become a, a strong runner? Huh. Uh, I'd say th this might sound very, very, very conservative, but I would probably... Okay, let's assume this person does not do any sports right now. We can do two instances. That's the first one. I, I would probably just run and do a mix of running and walking. And I'll do that once a week. And I would do everything I could to resist doing more. That's the hardest challenge. Mm. Um, but if you're experienced and you do some hiking or you've done climbing or, or play some ball games or whatever it might be, netball, um, uh, I start out by twice a week and have a have like do like three to six miles maybe tops. Start out really really slow. I think that's that's also a really good uh, foundation for getting a successful experience because it makes you feel if you start out really slow you have a greater potential of increasing later, which gives you motivation, which gives you a good experience. Uh, so um, a few times a week. And just do some easy runs. I know it sounds really not uh, not too efficient or anything, but it's about getting the feeling and getting a good experience, I'd say. Well, you know, we have a lifetime to enjoy these things. We don't have to be in a hurry, do we? <laughs> That's true. So I got to share, because m my running career was exactly what you just described. <laughs> I was uh, I was trying to become a better and better and better runner, and I kept doing more and more distance and pushing myself as hard as I could. And and I never quite got to the the big distances, but I did about a half marathon just on my own running. And mm. I did it too fast, and I ended up with a stress fracture. So mm. I broke my fibula by running too hard. Wow. Wow. And <laughs> so it was, it was really stupid. I finally learned that that no pain, no gain statement is misleading. You know, there's a good kind of pain and a bad kind of pain, and you have to know the difference. But what's interesting about that, Jens, is that ended up causing me to have a weak left knee. And so once the bone healed and I started running, then my knee was a problem. And yeah. it, it troubled me for actually several years. And I finally made the decision, okay, I'm going to back off on running so that I can keep hiking. Because yeah. I loved hiking so much. But now, of course, everything's healed up and I can run again. But I'm much more cautious than I ever was before because uh, I just really overdid it. And it, it ended 
my career as a runner, if you could call it a career, you know, my enjoyment of running had to stop so that I could do other things. Interesting. I think you're not the only one. <laughs> well, I think it's easy to do that. It's probably a good idea for people, and I, I did not do this, but for people to work with a coach enough to understand some of the things you shouldn't do when running. There are some mm -hmm. ways that we can run that can be very jarring and damaging, and there are other ways to run, I think, which work with the body so much better. So had someone shown me that, maybe I would have a different story. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what's it like in Copenhagen? Uh, it's autumn is coming. <laughs> you know, we have we have um, we have two months of summer, then we have half a week of autumn, and then we have eight months of winter, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, so autumn is around the corner, and then you can almost feel the winter is here. Um, no, just kidding. Autumn is autumn is uh, is great as well. Uh, it's getting a bit more chill outside. Uh, but you know, for running, the optimal running temperature is actually around. Oh, you do Fahrenheit. Can you convert for me, Kurt? I'll, I'll get close. Yeah, let's let's go so for it. Six degrees Celsius. Six degrees Celsius. So you double it. You add thirty-two, and you back off just a little bit. So that would be about forty-five degrees, maybe forty degrees Fahrenheit. We agree that's pretty cold, right? Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's it's not below freezing, right? which yeah, I think no, matters. No. Yeah. So that's actually the optimal running temperature. Um, so, uh, so in that matter, it's, uh, it's fine to be here, but I'd say the bad thing in terms of the weather and being outdoorsy uh, in Denmark is that we don't have the mountains as they do in Sweden and Norway. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it's snowing, um, we cannot really utilize it as well as they can in the mountains unfortunately. So that's our challenge here. Interesting. You know, it's funny what you say about how brief autumn is. I'm looking at my window while we're talking at all of the, uh, the fall colors on the trees, yellows and reds, but I'm looking through a blizzard right now. The snow is covering <laughs> the yellow trees. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> that's our world too. I think autumn is very short. Well, that's really, really cool. So you spent a couple of years in Norway and while you were up there, the running was very different then. Yeah. So actually, I also got injured from running. And this bothered me quite a lot. Um, I learned that so running is a really repetitive sport. You move one <laughs> foot in front of the other. That's basically what you do. And you keep doing that. Um, it's really efficient, but it's also very repetitive. And... I learned that running on straight surfaces, on asphalt and stuff, is is not really good for me. So I learned that actually running uphill or downhill was much better for me. So when we moved to Norway and we lived there for just about two years, um, I was running uh, even more than I did I did previously, and I was always running up or down. And very often you get it so steep that uh, no one runs there, um, not even the world's best. But that's just what I love the most, just running to a mountaintop and then down. That oh, was my favorite. I love um, that. I love that. And of course, in winter, you do more skiing um, uh, as opposed to running and then, and then some climbing as well. Yeah. Oh, neat. You know, I want to talk about one of the big events that you did in Norway that sounds really cool. But before we jump in there, uh, there's been a lot of debate in recent years about styles of running and styles of running shoes. And I just kind of would like to get your take on it. Not that anyone's wrong or right. I think what happens is people have to sort out what works best for each person, right? Yeah. But there was a time when the running shoes had a fairly high heel, very, very cushy, and that was considered really important to protect the joints. Recently, people have been saying, no, let's go to a minimalist approach where the heel is low and maybe there's not as much padding. And instead of do, using a heel strike in your stride, you're supposed to be running on the ball of your foot. Um, yeah. And then some people have taken up barefooted running. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious where you fall on that spectrum. Yeah. So this is, this is my point of view. And you should, whenever you ask someone about anything, you should consider... What is the interest of this person? What is his incentive in saying what he's saying? So 
as we might cover later, or as you mentioned in the introduction, um, my living is from not selling running shoes, but telling people what running shoes to buy. So I am biased in the way that you could say I should promote people. I should promote buying more running shoes, but I'm actually the opposite. Um, I think people have too many running shoes. And I think <laughs> okay. Just the uh, but I want to help people buy the right products. But uh, in terms of this, I think brands are dictators in uh, in the running environment and also partially in the outdoor environment. So they promote specific products which then become popular and everyone buys those products even though those products might not have had been the best products. Um, and what happens when there are 20 running shoe brands on the market and there is a new one who wants to enter but the market is, is pretty full? They try to create a new market within this market. Mm. So they try to create minimalism. Um, and that went on very successfully. Got got it backed by some science and stuff, uh, which those turned out to be very cherry-picked. Uh, they were fined by it afterwards as well. And the other brands, when they, once they see this is really popular, they jump on it and they start promoting these products as well. And then everyone wants minimalist running shoes. Then the next thing, the most recent move has been the opposite. It's quite funny, uh, but maximalist running shoes. So where you have extreme cushioning from the heel all the way to the forefoot, uh, mostly known from the Hoka running shoes. So again, we have the same situation. Previously, it was Five Fingers who came into the market and created this new market. But now we have uh, uh, Hoka. Uh, or Hoke One One, as they are called, um, who di- do these extreme maximalist running shoes. They look seriously ugly, but if you if you ask one who's wearing them, he would swear they're the best running shoes ever. And they are really bouncy, uh, super comfortable. And they came into the market, and now all the brands are also promoting their maximalist running <laughs> shoes. And so it, what's right? Like, what do we do? <laughs> History is repeating itself. Sure. Uh, this is all, this is just marketing. That's my point of view. So I've read hundreds of studies about running shoes and what shoes to buy and everything. And if I should just give one advice, it's comfort. So whatever is comfortable for you, buy it. That's it. If I could, I can make it that simple. Uh, all of those things of art support, it's all hype. It's, uh, we actually did at Run Repeat, we did because we wanted to find out finally. We were on to do a meta study on art support. I don't know if you're familiar with this or the listeners are familiar, but basically in, in the running environment, there has been like uh, a thought that either you're a neutral runner or you need some, you need some art support. So you would need a stability shoe or even a motion control running shoe. And what they do is they support your arch so that you don't fall inwards. Okay. And, this has been like a, a promotion or a way to uh, make people go to the running stores and buy the shoes at a higher price because it's more technology in the products. But if you look, we looked at more than 150 studies and we spent almost 300 hours on this. So it's two months full time just writing one article. Mm. And we found in the end, if you've not been recommended from a specialist, not just a running store, but a specialist to buy uh, shoes with extra support, you don't need it. Not even if you are told in a running store, you fall inwards, you need uh, stability shoes or motion control shoes. Don't just buy neutral shoes. That's that's what we found. So that's very interesting that there's a whole industry built around this. Um, but um, my take on it is that it's all marketing. Wow. So what really matters is comfort and proper training. I'm going to throw that in there because if you run the wrong way, you can hurt yourself, right? We already talked about that. Yeah. And I'll say also to this, I'd say, again, I should be promoting running shoes, but I'd say uh, uh, what running shoes you wear is like maybe 5% of, of, of the total risk of getting an injury and the remaining 95% is your running form and how much you increase your if, if you're training too much. Uh, so that's the other 95%. So don't worry too much about the running shoes, actually. Well, that's awesome. 
So we're going to come back and talk more about your company, Run Repeat, and uh, the, the unique way that you guys are offering shoes out there here a little bit later in the show. I want to get back to uh, what is going on in Norway with some of these events. But, um, Jens, I want to make this point. A lot of people that have an adventure sport can't do their adventure sport all the time because it's seasonal or location dependent or, or whatever. Maybe it just takes too much time. And so mm-hmm. many of them, to stay fit, they fall back onto running as what they do when they're not doing their other thing. Hmm. So what's Ooh. cool about that is that when we're learning more about running, especially for people that running is not their main focus, right? So what you're telling us is really going to help people to say, oh, okay, I get it, I get it, you know, and, and because they're doing running kind of on the side just to get that hmm. cardiovascular workout, to fire the muscles in their legs so they don't lose the training that they work so hard on for hmm. skiing or for hmm. mountain biking or hmm. other sports. So running is, is kind of like the universal fitness mechanism for everything else. So I'm really yeah, glad sure. that you're educating us. That helps a ton. Hmm. Really, really cool. Thank you. Fall is the best time to start thinking snow, and Bentgate Mountaineering is ready to help you get prepared for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in alpine touring, telemark, NTN, and splitboarding gear. Brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear from beacons to airbags, and they are ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. You can also rent skis, boots, split boards, beacons, shovels, and probes at Bentgate. What's more, they host free demo ski days at local resorts so you can try out the latest gear. Stop by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado, or go to bentgate.com to check out your new gear as well as to get updates on all of their events. Okay, so I'm going to try to say this word, and I'm going to put my fake Norwegian accent on it, and then you can say it correctly for us. Uh, this event is called the Eersfjord Traversen. Oh, that's really good, Kurt. <laughs> uh, now, so, how, how do you say it? So it's Eersfjord uh, Traversen, so, uh, and that's the Norwegian pronunciation. Um, I think it's uh, really hard <laughs> to pronounce in English, and I'm really impressed by it. <laughs> by your try. I'm not sure I was close, but it sounds like a really cool race. Tell us what this is. So, it's a a uh, it's a traverse of a full mountain ridge, uh, which consists of like it, it's many mountains that are connected, and they are following a fjord. So you know the Norwegian fjords, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so it follows it from the beginning all the way to the ocean. Actually, you start you start from the ocean uh, and you follow it all the way to its like most inner point. And you are you start out in like zero meters and you move up. You initially move up to around uh, one thousand meters. Um, and Norway is in many ways uh, not very high. In altitude compared to the Alps, so that's general for Scandinavia. Scandinavia is not really high in altitude, but it can be at least as steep. Um, and the reason we wanted to do this one, so this is this is not something you're gonna find easily on the internet or anywhere. There's one guy in northern Norway who who he's called Kugo Kugo. He um, he has set himself a goal to uh, get an all 666 summits that are above 1,000 meters. Uh, do we need a translation here, Kurt? 1,000 meters? 1,000 meters, that's 3,280 feet. Oh, okay, yeah. That was pretty fast, huh? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, 3,000 feet. Yeah, so there are 666 tops that 
are 3,200 uh, feet. And he wants to uh, get on top of all of them. And actually, he's missing, uh, I think he's missing just around 30. So he's like 95% done now. And he did this one as well, which inspired us, me and two friends to do this one. It requires some uh climbing experience uh and uh, mostly just being in in good shape what's really cool about norway is we have something called the midnight sun uh, which you might have heard of so uh, we had in tromsø which was where i lived we have every year every summer there are two months of complete sunlight so the wow. sun the sun never sets basically it's just like uh, well, it, it it just turns around in the uh, uh, in the sky. It's really really cool. Um, and we did it when there was like this midnight sun. Uh, so basically, there's just sunlight 24 hours a day, uh, which is amazing for doing outdoor sports. Then you have no time time limit on when you have to be somewhere because you can always see. You don't need a headlamp. That's less weight as well. So um, many advantages from this. I just want to add that if you do it in the winter, on the other hand, it's pretty challenging because you have two months with no sunlight at all. So people do get depressed. <laughs> yeah, that, that is different. I One other thing about having that midnight sun is that uh, the, the natural rhythm of the body that makes you feel sleepy is delayed by the sunlight as well. So you don't feel like it's bedtime even. At least I don't when I'm somewhere farther north. I don't feel like it's bedtime, and then I realize it's it's midnight, and I'm like, wow, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Have you have you experienced the midnight sun? I have seen sun at about 1130. I don't think I've ever made midnight. Oh, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Huh. Um, yeah, and, and so this, this traverse, uh, what makes it so cool, I think, is so I've been I've been to New Zealand as well, and they have these eight great hikes, and they are really nice in many ways. But there are lots of people on them. So, for instance, I did the Tongariro Alpine Crossing. It's just a one day. Most people can can do it. It's a wonderful hike. I think it's in I think it's top three hikes in the top three hikes in the world. It's on all the lists, and it's really amazing. But when you start, you take a bus to go to the starting and then you start starting point and then you walk through this very diverse uh, nature and get to volcanoes and stuff and you get back to your car but it's so touristic there's so many tourists uh basically there's one there's another guy one meter in front of you and one meter behind you <laughs> oh man and that's 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 like um you have to ask yourself what is the purpose of what you're doing um and if you want a great outdoor experience, you should consider, does that include another 2,000 people within 500 meters of me? Or does it include just me and nature? Right. And, so, and do you want people walking with a ghetto blaster or whatever they might be walking with? Or, uh, or do you want to be to have solitude in the mountains? Um, I'm not saying one is more correct than the other, but... Um, you have to ask yourself what what your interests are, and in this case, I'm more I'm more into northern Norway, where there's rarely any people. And when you meet someone else, you're like you're like best friends. <laughs> right. That's awesome. So, so the Ersfjord Traversen. Nice. It's running, hiking, and climbing. You're going up to about a thousand meters from zero, but then back down again. So yeah. does it require technical skills? You have to use ropes. Yeah, you have to use ropes. You do some abseiling, you do some climbing. Uh, it's pretty easy climbing, I'd say. Uh, that being said, I, I'm, a, I'm a climbing instructor myself. Uh, but on the first climb we did, I actually slipped. And I think I fell maybe four meters. And oh. I was, I was, uh, I'm sure you've had those experiences yourself, but I was just really, really scared afterwards. Uh, because climbing in the real mountains, that's just something different from from climbing indoors on a, or or doing sports climbing. Um, that's just something very different, I think. Uh, but I think you know a lot more about that than I do. I'm sure you have some bad experiences yourself. Too many, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you know what happens, and this is kind of funny, Jens. 
is that when you grow more and more familiar with the way that the rock behaves and what you can do on different types of rock and different pitches and slopes, you know, when you're outside a lot, that becomes the familiar. Mm. And so then when you go somewhere where you're like maybe in an indoor gym, that kind of feels awkward because it's so different, you know? So I think it's just a matter of what you grow accustomed to. But when you're outside, there are a lot of variables, you know, there's, there's weather, there's the rock integrity um, I, I fell off a cliff once because a 50 pound rock came off the cliff with me. Whoa. <laughs> Luckily I was over water, but that's what happens sometimes when you're outside, you know, the rock gets weathered yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So is that part of your experience? You really experience life when you have those, those experiences, like you feel like you're near, you're very near death. Uh, I'm not saying that once you try to get many near death, death experiences, but it, it does make you feel alive, really. Um, and and uh, about this traverse that we did, I think the climbing is so easy that some people would do it without rope. But that's like, that's really few people who would do that. Um, and also because some of the abseiling is, you cannot do that without rope, uh, but then they like do a shortcut or something to, to get it, to 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 avoid that, um, but I think the whole experience of setting a setting a goal. So this this tour was like twenty hours for us, and it was um, it's many hours walking on mountain ridges where you constantly can look down to the right side, and you can just look one thousand meters down. Wow! So three thousand three hundred no three thousand two hundred eighty meters down. Um, down to the fjord it's really amazing but you also need to concentrate and you know if, if you've been concentrating for for an hour you 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 cannot keep on being concentrated so it's it's really risky in many ways also um yeah i think actually that that is one of the biggest risks of expedition style climbs as well as adventure racing and the endurance races that last for extended periods of time. It's can you keep your mind sharp and ready and paying attention so that, mm. you know, you don't make a mistake. That's That really did is you, a did challenge. You co- did you cover that with the Chris Warner, who you yeah. had on the, the podcast previously? Yeah, we talked about that somewhat. Um, there are a lot of shows that we've done with a, kind of what I would call ultra sports events like uh doing the 500 mile colorado trail on a mountain bike uh they do it in four (laughs) days so they sleep an hour a night uh Mm. that kind of stuff doing the the great divide or the tour divide uh, that's where they do three thousand miles and they're trying to set a record so they may only sleep an hour or two a night um (laughs) and they do that for day after day after day that that kind of thing is uh is a real challenge and that's, I have to say, it's a little bit dangerous. We've had guests on here that have confessed that they start hallucinating. <laughs> and it makes wow. for funny stories. But that's one reason why a lot of the ultra events, especially the ultra running events, you get a pacer that will run beside you to help keep you yeah. safe because they know that you're going to get to the point where you're really not safe by yourself anymore. Mm, yeah, it's true. That. Yeah. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. I think there was. Are- I think there are some guys you've had on this podcast who have had like uh, really insane uh, near death experiences uh, as compared to my four meter fall. But it's just, you know, it also depends on, on your experience when, when, when it's one of your first really big slips, uh, right. the adrenaline really rushes through your body and you're just so scared. It, it's funny how it influences your decisions afterwards. Uh, but it's just a, uh, getting up again and and keep going Uh, it's really important to get started again i think sure you bet and four meters i mean we're talking about oh goodness four meters is uh what about 14 15 feet i mean that's a that's a pretty good drop you could you could do some serious damage at that height matter of fact it only takes about six feet to kill you if you land the wrong Hmm. way that's a yeah. stat that a lot of people don't know. But if you land the wrong way, six feet can kill you, which is wild. It's not common that it would, obviously. You drop six feet, normally you're not hurt. Mm, but no. when you double or triple that distance, you're getting into the range where you can do some serious damage. So how did you land? And did did you get injured at all? I landed 
miraculously uh, like five, ten centimeters above a like the plateau where uh, where we were standing. So that was like it was really a pointy uh, uh, rock we were standing at. So I say. A 0.1 second slower reaction from this guy, and uh, I would most probably have been super injured. So, oh. luckily, we were lucky this time. So we kept on going, and uh, this traverse had like um, I think it's around 10 summits in total that you cross, um, and it's around what would that be in in uh, in feet? That would be around. At around 10,000 feet, I think, uh, of elevation. Uh, but 10,000 feet is a, is a lot, yeah, but I'm sure there are many people who have done a lot more. But what you have to count into this as well is that you're walking on this edge constantly and you're constantly concentrated, so you're so exhausted. Right. Um, um, on the day we did it, we were lucky, we were fortunate that the, the clouds were hanging really low, so they were at around to 300 meters uh, so we were just looking down at the down at the down at the clouds constantly um, but actually um, when we came around two-thirds of the of the way uh, we had a really hard talk about if we should continue or not you know I'm sure you had you've had many of those experiences should we continue or not uh, I don't know if you have like Kurt, do you have like some general rules on when you want to continue or when you do not want to continue? I think that most of mine are based on the weather and how much time we have left and how the conditions are going to change, which, yeah. you know, it's kind of hard to know. Sometimes you just have to make your best guess. But some guests who have come on the show have said, you know, when there's a disagreement about whether to continue or not, they choose beforehand that they're going to go with the most conservative opinion. Huh, that's a good one. Yeah, just that's to be safe. One. You know, they say, yeah. okay, if anyone's not comfortable with this, we're turning around. And that's yeah. kind of become a, a rule that we follow when we do our mountain mm -hmm. ring. That's a good one. I think in, in our situation, um, we, we, we were starting to get exhausted after these uh, 17 hours we were at now. Um, and it was mostly a decision based on how would our concentration would it last for the next like one third of the road or should we just get down uh so we actually decided to get down and failed at this so but that's just a good excuse to get back one day and finally complete it um i have completed almost every section of this one uh, but not in one go so unfortunately as happens with such uh, events Sometimes you need to just get down. So we got down and unfortunately, you know, when you're in the mountains, if you get down, it does not mean that you just get down to your car. We got down at, I think it was 2 a.m. in the morning. And the, as, as I mentioned, the clouds were two to 300 meters. So they were also uh, um, at sea level where we were. And you don't just get down to your car. You have to find your car where you get down because you <laughs> We got down at the opposite side of the <laughs> of the mountain, so we had a uh, uh, just just uh, in miles that would be uh, yeah around thirteen miles walk to do after having been, having been twenty hours or seventeen hours on the ridges. We had to do uh, to do uh, uh, those thirteen miles of walking. Uh, just on asphalt and that was super boring <laughs> <laughs> but and and exhausting no doubt but that's yeah. kind of the way that a lot of these things can turn out you know you find yourself saying well i have to keep going and you try to do it in a safe way but you just have to keep going and and i have found you get kind of to a point where you don't really get more tired you just stay very tired the whole time is that what you yeah. experienced yeah, you, you get like into this meditative state, I think. Right. No one is talking and you just you just move, basically. 
Uh, I remember so many hikes like that. My friend and I used to use walking sticks, and we would get to the point where the only thing you could hear would be the footsteps and the dragging of the stick. Scrape, mm. scrape, <laughs> scrape. <laughs> it just brings back memories. That's fun. Lots of fun. And you said that one of your favorite runs still is to do the one kilometer vertical events. And that's kind of unique. I've not heard a lot about that in the U.S. So what do you mean by a one kilometer vertical run? Yeah, so it's a big thing in Europe here, especially in the in the southern part, in the, in the Alps, where a race distance is not determined by the length, but by the height, you could say, of it. So it's uh, 1,000 1, vertical meters. So was that 3,280? Sure. Yep, <laughs> you got it. And um, it's just about getting on top the fastest. There is most often one route, though, that you would follow. Um, and most often people are surprised by how long time this actually takes. Uh, now, many of the guys on this podcast might be well aware of how long it takes to travel yourself uh, one vertical uh, kilometer. Um, but I think... Killian Chonette, the world champion in mountain running, trail running, he has done it in 35 minutes, around 35, maybe 33 minutes. And for me, it's, for me, it takes maybe 52 minutes. Uh, and uh, I'd say I'm in pretty good shape, <laughs> but compared to Killian, the world champion, of course, I'm I'm really bad shape. But I think <laughs> this, it's just it's just the the total distance is maybe. Most often, just around two miles, I'd say. So it's it's like the it, it's um, it's like 30, 30 to thirty five degrees, like on average. Wow, uh, that's steep, very steep. Yeah, it's really really steep, and it's just what is what is really cool about this distance, I think, is um, you are activating bigger muscles than if you're running on a flat surface, which means that your heart rate can go higher than if you're running on flat surface um, because you you need to transport more oxygen around your body. So you can keep a really, really high heart rate, which is super tough. <laughs> um, so it's, a real, it's in many ways a really, really tough race because you can do more than what you actually think because you feel so – you're not hallucinating, but, but you can get really close to it. Uh, and I think, it's, I think that's, that's, that's definitely my most – uh, my, my preferred distance to do um actually red bull not that i combine red bull with like outdoor life but they have <laughs> a, they have a pretty cool uh, event in italy and that's uh, actually ten thousand. Uh, uh what was it feet or what was it 10 yeah ten thousand feet right yeah ten thousand so three thousand meters so around ten thousand feet race wow just vertical uh, I am most probably going to attempt that one next year. So you can multiply my time of 52 minutes by three and then add maybe 20% to that. So we have three hours and you're maybe covering like uh, six miles. So it's going really, really slow. Really steep, uh, really slow, but yeah. that's a lot love, of effort. Yeah. And you don't have to consider getting down. Right? Of course you need to get down, but you're done when you're on top. I like that. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, just to put this into perspective, there are a lot of uh, listeners that like to do Colorado 14ers. And the 14ers in Colorado mean you go to 14,000 feet. Often, you're only doing around three, 4,000 vertical feet because you start so high up. But most mm -hmm. hikers, and I've said hikers on purpose, not runners, most hikers need to, uh, they need to figure about an hour per thousand vertical feet for their climb. That's good. That's good. I'd say. And, uh, so the, but that's feet, not meters. <laughs> right. And so yeah. it, you've got to, you've got to realize that what you're doing is three times that fast. Ah, yeah. Sorry. I saw, I thought you said meters. That's no. why I thought, Oh, that's really fast <laughs> hiking pace. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about just hiking. And of course that means you're going up to fairly high altitude, everything above tree line. Uh, it gets pretty sketchy. The, the air is so thin and, you know, people aren't acclimated to, to running at 14,000 feet. So, you know, that, that slows things down as well. But what you're talking about is covering about three times the distance or the, the vertical feet 
right? Mm. As kind mm. of the average 14er climb uh, pace. So that's, that's pretty aggressive. That's, that's hard work, man. This episode of the Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by 180TAC.com. 180TAC manufactures premier backpacking and emergency products. Whether you need a backpacking stove for your week-long trek on the trail or an emergency stove for your bug-out bag, we have the tools you need. Visit www.180tack.com. Well, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about, I I gave the teaser at the beginning of the show, but I want to talk a little bit about your approach to life and to business as it relates to an adventure-focused lifestyle. I think so many adventurers have to sort out, how can I have time for my adventures, for my life experiences, the things I feel really enrich me, but still earn a living and uh, manage a, a kind of a, the standard obligations of life at the same time. And that's difficult to do. So what's your take on that? Hmm, yeah. So, uh, of course, there are many ways to try to take control of one's life and do what one loves to do. Um, I can give my story in short, which was that um, uh, I wanted to create a business for myself uh, where I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. So that was basically like the criteria wow. so that I could be outdoors when I wanted. Because in in in, uh, in Norway, for instance, the weather is changing constantly. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't know what you call it, but when, when, when there are mountains near the sea, so the changing, I don't know what you call this, it has a term, uh, but there's a lot of rain, uh, lots of snow in the winter. Um, but the weather is changing a lot. So if if the weather was great in the morning, uh, I'd go skiing in the morning or I'd go hiking in the morning or climbing. And then I'd work in the evening or maybe I'd not work that day because I was so exhausted. And then I'd work the day after. I think it's my opinion that 95% of corporations and jobs today, uh, at least office jobs, um, has not adopted to the lifestyle that people want today. Um, and it's not that I need to change that for the world. I just want to have it my way in my company. Uh, so we are, we, we, we've grown from just being me to, to now be 50 people. And everyone works with, um, the freedom to work as much as one like whenever one, one likes. So you can work uh, evenings, you can work weekends. Uh, you can you can do as you like, basically. Uh, most often, actually, um, people take off Thursday, Friday to go on an extended weekend, for instance. That freedom. I mean, having a work is, is, is not just sitting at a desk. And I mean, uh, it should also be fun to, to be at work. And you, you spend one third of your life sleeping, one third of your life working. Uh, it's 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 a good idea to invest in a good bet, uh, and it's a good idea to invest in a good company that Absolutely. you want to work. Uh, uh, considering how much how much time and money you spend in the remaining eight hours you have, you should definitely consider more where you work and find a job that you really love. Um, so so my take on is that um, more individual freedom is definitely possible, but I think the change is not really. I know that. Um, it's said that one third of the U.S. economy is driven by freelance work. Um, I, th- I think that many big corporations have not adopted to this, and I think the the future uh, um, will will the good employees will go to the companies that offer more freedom. I think uh, because at least from my experience, everyone who I'm having job interview with are not happy with their working hours. That's that simple. Yeah. You know what's interesting? It's not just about the number of hours you work. It's also about the location where you have to go for work. And you know what? I spoke, sorry to interrupt. I just have a rich example here. I spoke with a Filipino 
who live 17 kilometers out of uh, uh, from the center of Manila, the capital. He traveled to the center every day for work. Okay, this is an extreme example, but he had three hours of commuting each way every day. He basically traveled. Uh, that would be five times six. That's 30 hours. He traveled 30 hours per week. Mm-hmm. And my first question was, okay, so that's you could walk that distance in the same time. It, this in the same t- time it takes you to commute. And he said, <laughs> yeah. But it's so polluted. So he did not want to to be out there. He said it's much. He will live longer by taking the bus. But there's so much traffic jam that it takes him three hours each way. So and 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 it's just so much time wasted. I think eighty or ninety percent of the people that I work with, they work from home, uh, and they and they try to establish. Some do it well. Some do not do it well. Um, a good working environment uh, in a separate room where you like feel like this is my workspace. Um, uh, there are still another 10% who prefers to go to a co-working space, uh, myself included, and the company would pay for that. Um, so it's not like you're saving money by staying at home. You're just not getting the shared office, but people prefer to be home. Many have kids as well. They'd love to be spend more time with their kids and work when they're sleeping instead. Now I've been talking a lot. <laughs> no, that's that's fascinating. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I think that your perspective is an idea whose time has come. We think about uh, taking care of the environment. We think about the increasing wars and expenses associated with you know, using fossil fuels to move ourselves from one place to another. These long mm-hmm. commutes in cars, the expense of the automobile. If you had that money, what could you afford to do if you didn't have to spend it on the car? right? Yeah. Uh, you start yeah. adding up all of these variables. And then the funniest part to me is corporations that require their employees to come into the office. They have to lease or buy large <laughs> office spaces, which are extraordinarily expensive, with cube farms that are very, very expensive. The companies could save millions upon millions of dollars just in their infrastructure expenses by saying, hey, you can work remotely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's insane, and 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 run repeat is is also saving money from that definitely. But it's not like we're saying that people cannot have a co-working space, but they just don't want to. They actually prefer to be from home. Uh, but uh, this sounds really cool, but you also have to look at the downsides of this. So where's your social life if you don't have colleagues near you? Of right. course, we do video chatting and everything, but. It's just not the same as being next to each other. So it has its disadvantages, definitely. And that one has to consider as well. Well, Jens, here's the question that always pops up about this. How do you know if someone is doing enough work to earn the money that they're being paid? I mean, that's a bottom line, right? Are people yeah. productive enough to uh, to have earned their income? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. But uh, I think sometimes it's, it's not easier to determine that if you're sitting next to the person. Uh, actually, I think <laughs> uh, you're just disturbing that person even more so that he does not deliver any results because I, at least I, I, I experience that from myself sometimes that if if a colleague is working on something really interesting, I'll be like, ah, oh, so so are you done now? Are you done now? <laughs> and um, and constantly trying to 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 uh, to get some feedback on how things are going while I should not worry about that because people also have uh, interest in um, in being significant. I think that no one is interested in uh, having a job where they don't make a difference. Sure. But of course, there will always be people who will try to cheat the system. Of course, there will always be. Uh, and we have had such examples as well, of course. And there, there have been so far and there will be in the future. No doubt about it. Um, uh, detecting those is like, mm, uh, yeah, are the results any good? And uh, of course, we cannot. It, it's not like it's not like uh, uh, it's not heaven where if you're working for this company, then you don't have to work at all. I mean, it's not like that. Of course, I I expect results. Uh, and uh, if you are not good enough, then there's most probably another one who is good enough. So 
uh, it's also performance based. It should not. Sometimes I think this this idea of remote work sounds so cool and 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 everything, but but uh, and you and no one can monitor what you're doing, etc. But what one also has to deliver results. Sure, you know I think traditionally people had to show up to work at a certain time and they had to stay there until a certain time. And then there was someone monitoring their activity to try to keep them productive for that period of time. And so we've built our industries kind of around that hourly Mm -hmm. wages and then salaried employees that turned into kind of an excuse and and not in all companies, but in some companies it's like, okay, I don't have to pay you for your time anymore. So I'm going to give you more and more and more work. And maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, I can get, 14, 15 hours a day out of you for the same money. That that mm. started happening with the salary model. And then people start mm. pushing back. And, you know, there's all that give and take. But what you're talking about is more of a production model. It's, okay, you need you have to be productive. You have to produce. We need to see results. So yeah. here's our expectation for the results, right? Yeah. You do that on your time and your way, and the everyone's happy. Yeah. And I think, I think if, if, for, I've asked lots of my friends and uh, people I meet. Um, so if you take a work day of eight hours and let's subtract the, the lunch break, let's say you work seven hours a day. And if you need to be really honest, how much would you say of that time that you actually do concentrated work? Most people, you'll be surprised. You should try to do this exercise. Uh, I think the average is around 30% of the time people work. The remaining time, they are looking at what next expedition they should be doing, how to get <laughs> funding for the expedition, uh, what rope to buy, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm also a fan of actually working less uh, than what we do now. I'm not myself working less, uh, but I can clearly see that the more I work, the 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 worst my efficiency but that's like it's no no it's like that's expected um, right yeah it, it's, it really is hard to be super productive for an extended period of time yeah. and what's neat about your model though which is fascinating especially in the in the idea of adventure sports right and having more freedom of location and and time mm. is that if if someone knows how much they need to get done and that can become a motivating factor to get it done more efficiently, then that frees up their time to do other things, and that encourages them, it's a positive feedback, to be more productive in the time that they're working. Mm, definitely. We've, we've had several Americans applying for jobs who, 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 who did adventure sports uh, because they wanted the freedom to do their sports, actually. So um, very relevant, I'd say. Mm, I love it. You also mentioned earlier before we started recording here that you really believe in the philosophy of minimalism and how does that work into an adventure focused lifestyle? I think there are many ways of doing an adventure and and I lived uh, plus two years with just 100 items. So that's uh, five pair of underwear, five pair of socks, then you got 10% of everything you own already. Um, basically, I could fit everything into a backpack, and I just love that lifestyle. You wow. really appreciate the stuff that you own. Um, of course, if you do sports, uh, there are some sports that require a significant amount of equipment. For instance, climbing. Uh, it would be hard with, I mean, just doing climbing alone, you'd probably have the first 100 items, right? Sure. Um so, so there are things where you are restricted, uh, but there's a huge sharing economy out there that enables you to own less. Um, uh, but minimalism comes down to, uh, for me, uh, appreciating the things that I own and uh, not being attached to things. Uh, so that's, that's the, the two most important things to me. And uh, we live, first and foremost, we live in a rat race and we live in a, uh, keeping up with the Joneses environment. Uh, um, that's for most people, at least. I'm not saying where every, everyone is like this. Um, but apparently that's just how human is, is built, uh, that we try to impress other people, which is fine. But I, I think it's fine to try to impress other people. Uh, but I'd also say there are probably many other ways to, to do this. Well, while you were saying that, I counted the items on my desk 
and not <laughs> counting the pencils and pens that I have in a jar, I'm up to 20 items. So I, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I've already taken up a fifth of the hundred, and that's just on my desk. <laughs> yeah, you're probably going to have to prioritize removing some of those things from the desk. <laughs> well, I've got a couple of small speakers and a microphone. That's pretty important for what I do. I have a monitor and a laptop and a mouse, and you know, it kind of kind of adds up. Yeah, yeah, and, and and then you go to the your bathroom and and and. And you open like any any anything that can be opened, and you're like, "Oh, that's another 50. Uh, <laughs> you really, you quickly, you really quickly get. I think very few people own less than uh, two thousand things. I'd say. Very you know what? I, I think you're probably tr- you're probably right. My wife and I, uh, we have four children. Yeah, and two of them are now in college, and two are at home. But that's a pretty good family size. It required more stuff. That's my excuse, Mm. right? We've always tried to be minimalist. We don't hang on to things. Every year we try to get rid of stuff. Uh, We try Mm. to make things that we have last and only keep the things that really matter to us. So that's the philosophy, right? When we recently Mm. moved, we got rid of at least a third of our our belongings. We said, we just don't need this. Let's get rid of all of this so we don't have to move it. And then Mm. when we actually moved what we had left over, we couldn't believe how much we still had. <laughs> I am I am blown away by how much stuff accumulates, even when you're trying to get rid of it. And Jens, I know that you are much better at this than I am, but I've started coming to this perspective. When I think about purchasing an item, I think about, well, how am I going to dispose of this later? Hmm. Yeah. I start thinking about, yeah. you know, what's it going to cost me to have it, and, and how am yeah. I going to get rid of it someday? And then sometimes yeah. I'm like, it's not worth it. I don't want it in my life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I tend to use the, the um, okay, I want this now. Uh, let's wait 30 days and see if I still want it. Right. Uh, of, course I don't, I, of course, I don't do that if, if I'm hungry and I want to buy a bagel. I mean, I'm buying a bagel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but for things like uh, a new mouse, laptop, uh, Whatever, whatever it might be, a uh, new pair of jeans. Do I really want it? I'm, I'm waiting always like 30 days plus. Yeah. It's a good exercise. You could also do the one of removing, so uh, picking uh, just uh, 10 shirts, t shirts and shirts, uh, and like for what you need, what you need to wear for 10 days. Okay. Put that on the floor, then everything else. Uh, you move away so that you don't see it. And then after 10 days, you evaluate and think of, are you missing some of the things that you moved away? And if you're missing any of those items, you can you can uh, go and get them, but you cannot get things that you are not missing. And that way you will really quickly realize, oh, I just have 10 bags of things I don't like miss at all. Right. So yeah. what are the benefits of this? For your lifestyle, it, it's a it's a cool thing to think about mm. doing because I, I just like the idea of having a lighter load, right? Mm. But what yeah. are the benefits that, for your it's, lifestyle? It's it is a lighter load. It's really uh, things worry people. Um, owning things worry people, um, and that's actually point number one: uh, less worrying, I'd say. And that's just one place to start. Of course, your mind is probably the most messed up place. Uh, so, uh, but it's just an easy excuse to start with the things that are in your life. But it is a way to clean up, I'd say. Mm. Yeah. What about time? Do you find that you save time this way? Huh. That's a good one. I don't know, Kurt. <laughs> well, I, I can say this. Uh, having raised four kids, I spent so much time moving their stuff from one place to another. You know, out Uh, of delivering them into the bedroom, from the washer and dryer into their drawers, or (laughs) you see what I'm saying? Yeah. The more stuff you have, or if your kitchen is overloaded, then that means that the dishes tend to pile up, and then it takes a lot of time to do those dishes. Where if everybody has just one plate, one glass, and they wash it when they're done with it, there's never any dishes to do. Of course, we never got there, but it's a good idea. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. But what what if you get guests then? You need like spare 
items for them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I love the idea of minimalism and thanks for sharing that with us. I think it's a, uh, it's a cool idea because it can be very liberating. It can be cost effective, but it's also really good for the planet. But like mm. you mentioned, if we declutter our lives with stuff, maybe it declutters our mind as well. <laughs> and I love that. I think that's probably Actually, correct. So, for instance, I love books, but now I don't put them on a the shelf anymore. When I'm done with the book, consider who would love to read this book. And I give mm. that book to that specific person. So that's, it's a win-win as well in that situation. Very cool. Just well, we got to get the, the word out a little bit about your company. We've been talking about the philosophies behind it, which I think are awesome. But it's called runrepeat.com. And if you go there, then there are, wow, looks like we have about 20 to 25 different brands of shoes. There are trail runners, there are street runners, all sorts of running shoes. And there's a filtering mechanism that allows people to kind of hone in on what shoes might be the best for them. And then you also have segments here where runners are reviewing the shoes. So people can get a lot of reviews about how a shoe performed for different runners. Um, yeah. Did I kind of encapsulate that? What have I missed? Yeah. So um, the whole idea of Run Repeat is to um, to allow the runner uh, to get an overview of the entire market. So for, if you go to a running store, which is a great idea to go to a local running store. But if you go there, they're gonna, they, they'll probably have 30 pairs of running shoes, which is a very limited uh, amount of the total number of running shoes that are on the market. And they have selected those shoes based on some criteria. One could think of profit margins, for instance, or one could think of what shoes are popular. Uh, but I wanted to create just one huge database of all running shoes. And that was the foundation of Run Repeat. And I didn't want brands to influence this in any way. So it should be as neutral and transparent as possible. So that's the foundation of the site. And I can also add one thing to, which, which might make it like slightly more exciting to the, to the audience of this uh, uh, podcast is that we're expanding into including uh, uh, hiking footwear as well, uh, because that's very, um, there are good synergies between hiking and running footwear. Oh, yeah. Well, when the weather is good, I prefer to do 14ers in trail runners. Yeah. Faster, lighter. Yeah, like, it works yeah. great. When when the weather's in question, then I want the hiking boots, right? Yeah. Um, but for instance, I'm on your website here, and I love the way this works. So you click men's shoes. I click trail shoes. I'm going to go with your neutral arch support because someone told me just a little bit ago that that's the way to go. Um, I'm going to say daily running instead of competition, and then I could choose my favorite brands, but I'm going to leave that open. I don't want waterproof. I do like water repellent, and then I can do low drop. I can do maximal drop. Um, I can go do weight. I'm going to go lightweight. And where are we now? I just got it down to nine shoes that I should look at, which I love because I selected all the stuff that kind of got rid of all the noise that I didn't want to look at anyway. Now, that was with a, a start of, what was it, like 600 different options out there for me. And now I'm mm -hmm. down to nine shoes that I can investigate. I can look at the reviews, and I can say, I wonder if this would be the shoe for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that yeah. is awesome. You're, it's, yeah. you're doing what you said. Instead of having, you know, 30 shoes on the wall to, that someone else chose for me, I'm able to wade through hundreds of styles and functions of shoes to come up with the ones that are most suited to my needs. And, and, and uh, thank you for the kind words, but one also has to consider that there's a huge drawback of buying online, which is an, a whole other discussion we can have one day. But, but uh, as I mentioned earlier in the call, if people remember, comfort is everything. Mm. And how to determine comfort if you're buying online? So uh, uh, it can be like uh, risky to buy running shoes online, uh, I'd say. I know I should be advocating people buying running shoes online, but I don't want to be uh, <laughs> like not honest about this. Well, if, uh, if I order a pair of shoes from you and then I, I find out that they actually just don't fit 
then what are my options? Yeah, so run repeat, we don't sell running shoes ourselves. So we just show you where you can buy the running shoes. So if you click into one of the specific running shoes, we would compare prices from, uh, I think for the, for, for the US, uh, it would be around 60 or 70 stores. So basically all stores we've been able to find so far, 60 free shops at the moment. So we're comparing prices from all of those uh, retailers. And what I think is cool is that you can very, very often, very often, if you go to a shopping engine side, um, uh, you cannot, most often you cannot select size. And that's a really big disadvantage of the shopping engines because, you know, very often there's this size US 18 <laughs> uh, that is, uh, available at uh, just $30 and then you click on that deal and realize it's just that one size. Whereas at run repeat, you can select your size and see the specific price for that specific product. Um, uh, and also actually specific color. So I think that that part is done well by us, I would say. And then big disclaimer, uh, if you click on a link to one of the retailers and you buy something, then we get a small commission from that. And that is basically what pays the salaries. Uh, but it's only if you're paying something and you're not uh, buying something. And it's not like increasing the price of what you're buying. Wow, that's great. So we're not dry, uh, buying the shoes directly from your company. So the return policies would be the return policies of the company that we buy them from. But by going through your company, we get the option of finding the best solution for us at the price we want. Man, yeah. that's really powerful. That's great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. So it's fun. I just clicked on one shoe, and it showed me some of the best prices, and it says 63 shops analyzed. Man, that's that's <laughs> a one-stop shop. That's cool. <laughs> that it is, yeah. We, we, are, we are doing our best, and if any, any stores are missing, we are, we are happily listening to our users, uh, what stores we should be adding. Uh, it is really important for us to have any store. Basically, we want all stores to be online on this. And of course, it's not from it's not all of the stores that we get actually get a commission from. Some of them don't want to give us a commission, and and that's also uh, a bit tough for us. I mean, should we then send you to the shop that gives us a commission? <laughs> no. And we try. We think, okay, what's important to us? It's to be transparent and neutral. So we should always show you the best price. Mm. Wow. Well, that's cool. So, Jens, I think it's an awesome company. I love the approach. And uh, I also think it's really good. Like I mentioned, running is kind of the default activity that we all have to do to stay in shape to do the other things we love to do. So every adventurous person out there needs the right pair of running shoes for them. And for me, it's going to be a trail runner. It's going to be something that has a, a good soul, good traction, and something that's going to be fairly lightweight that I can use on uh, 14ers in the summertime. So I'm going to be looking for that on your site. Uh, let me know what you find out. Okay. Very, very cool. Well, man, we have burned through our time, and it's been so much fun to talk to you. I love the idea of some of the types of running adventures that you described in Norway. You know, along the fjords, extended hours of being up above the clouds, summiting maybe up to 10 peaks in one day. I mean, that's craziness, right? But I can't imagine how uh, how unique the experience must have been for you to do that event. And I, uh, I think that the memories are probably what it's all about for me, really. I love being out there and doing it. But when you look back on it, it it's it's kind of a an encouragement or a place mark in your life when you look back on, on how your life has been and you say like, that was something I did that mm -hmm. year. And, and that's how it impacted me. Does that do that for you? Yeah, definitely. Mm, that's very definitely. cool. I think it's why it's so important that we do ad adventure sports. And I, I could go on about that forever. And the listeners are probably tired of me going on about it forever. <laughs> so I won't say more, but thank you for sharing that with us. Very cool. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you for being here. Oh, you bet. And for all of our listeners out there, until the next show, get out there and have some fun. And if you don't know where your running shoes are yet, then go to runrepeat.com. Thanks, Jens. Thank you. On Monday's episode, Mike McIntosh will be here to talk about understanding bear behavior. 
Until then, visit our Patreon page and get out there and have some fun.